Hebrews chapter 11. We'll look at verse 35. Verse 35. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. You notice in this passage right here, we see fellow brethren back in the past who have bled, suffered, tortured, and died for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that these people are blessed by God and they will obtain their reward. And the Bible says that we by believing Christians can learn a valuable lesson from these blessed saints of the past who were tortured and put to death for the name of their God. And I would like to tell you a story of brothers and sisters of Christ in the past who have bled and died for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The bloodiest torture in all of history next to the death of our Lord Jesus Christ was probably the Catholic, the infamous Catholic Inquisition. You talk about bloody, horrendous torture. You read their life story, it will put you under conviction and it will make you stop sobbing about your own sufferings in life. I hope today's sermon will be a blessing to you. So today, so today let's talk about Fox's Book of Martyrs. Amen. Let's pray. Fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Wash away my sins with your blood. God, all I am is an empty vessel. Thank you so much for the people who came to church today, for the songs that were sung, for the offering that was given, for the time that was given to glorify your name. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll please bless the remainder of the hours. May we be edified, fully blessed, but most of all, may you be fully glorified. God, I am worth nothing without you, so please shed grace and mercy upon me. Use me, Lord, so that these people can give you glory out of today's preaching. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. My first point is violence out of tribulation. Go to Luke 21. Luke chapter 21. My first point is violence, violence out of tribulation. You got to understand that during the bloody inquisition, it was a time of great violence, turbulence. It was awful. It was a bloody, awful history. And Jesus Christ forewarned his children about the trials. Look at Luke chapter 21 verse 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Sell it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Amen to that. Amen. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents, have you been? And brethren, have you been? And kinsfolks, and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Jesus Christ forewarned his children that your loved ones will turn against you. But Christ said, you know, have peace in me. Have peace in me because I have overcome the world. Jesus Christ, he said that I'll give you a mouth and wisdom. And when your enemies try to turn against you, I will give you the words what to say. You don't have to meditate. You don't have to think. I'll give you the words I want to say. And these martyrs, boy, did they had mouths to speak. Uneducated. They weren't scholars, yet they had a mouth to speak. So we don't need educated diplomas and degrees to speak out against the whole world, no matter what the world turns against you. The violence throughout the Inquisition was so bloody and horrendous. I'm going to describe to you the torture devices that were given in the Inquisition. And I want you to see what your brothers and sisters in Christ went through. One of them was called the rack. The rack, they were actually small ropes. And when they tied your hands and your feet, 
then they would uh, pull the ropes so then your body will be hanging midair. But because those ropes were so small, it would cut through the skin, through the muscles, it would even reach to the bone. And it would reach to the bone and blood would squirt out in eight different directions while the body is hung midair. Another torture device was a pulley. What they did was they tied ropes with your hands behind your back and like this, then they would pull the rope, all right? And then you'd be hanging in the air like this, you see? So then your arms would tend to want to flip this way, you see that? But on top of that, they would add weight on your feet. And the weight would be nearly, it would be nearly a hundred pounds of iron. And with that weight, then the arms would crack. And it would be dislocated. And it would cause a jerk reaction of the nerves and joints. Dislocation and internal bleeding. And then when they throw you down, you know what they did? <laughs> they set the joints back again and they pull you up for another round. That's what your brothers went through. The Iron Maiden, it was basically a coffin full of spikes inside. And they would throw the Christians inside that coffin filled with spikes. And can you imagine when that coffin door closes, the spikes, you're just looking right at them and they close in on you. And then when they open up the coffin again, you come out of the coffin with your body full of holes. Not only that, some of the spikes, were some of the spikes would even go through your eyes. That's what the Iron Maiden was during the Inquisition. The, another torture device was the water table. The water table was a flat table where they would lay their victim down. And they would force a long, rough cloth down your throat. And they would pour in the water bit by bit so that the cloth can be forced down through your throat. And then they would force down that rag all the way down to the intestines. And finally, when it reaches over there, you know what they do? They force out the rag after that, and then it rips up all of your insides. Many pregnant mothers who are by believers, they were laid on that table, and their pregnant babies would die because of the water table. So, you would, so while they forced down that rag down your throat, you would be slowly drowning. And not only that, they would sometimes use boiling water to force down the rag, to add the torture on you. There was another torture device called the heretic fork. The heretic fork, it was a large fork that was tied tightly underneath the chin like this, you see? So then while it's tied like this, and the, the, the fork blades is pretty scary if you look at it. And that heretic fork, it would be forced down and tied around you like this. So you can't even move your mouth because if you talk, then the lower jaw would automatically hit the blade and then you stab yourself like this. And if you move your neck down just a little bit like this, the fork blades would stab through your, through your lower jaw and the blades would stick out of your mouth. Victims, they were also tortured on another device with rollers. And these rollers were filled with knives. And when they roll the victim through those rollers, then they go back and forth, back and forth. And those rollers were filled with blades as well. Another torture device was the burning stake. That was the most popular, the most common throughout the Inquisition. Look, people, if you burn at the stake, that's not a... That's not the way to go. That's one of the worst tortures you can get, all right? It's not just that simple. Oh, you go over there, you burn. You got to realize this. Why else do you think God thought of the worst punishment as a burning hell? You see, burning is torture. It's horrendous. Some people would literally burn for hours, you've got to understand. See, you're stuck over there and that flame is burning up your toe and then up your heels and then slowly that fire goes up. I mean, it's just driving you crazy. Victims were burned alive for hours. If you were lucky, if you were very lucky to die at a short moment, you know how you died? You would choke in the smoke. That's how you would die, if you were lucky. If you were even more lucky than that, then what they did was, if they begged the Catholic priest for mercy and for forgiveness, 
Then those Catholic priests, they would tie gunpowder bags around their neck so that when the fire catches on the gunpowder, it blows off their head. And that was out of mercy. That was the most lucky way to die. That's how your brothers and sisters in Christ died back then. The socks. They were, you saw those in television shows, but it's not as innocent as you think. The stocks were one of the worst torture devices. They would lock up the feet on the stocks and they would brand the feet and they would burn the feet. And if that person would not recant his belief, would not renounce his faith, then they would tear one toenail out at a time. Do you renounce your faith? No. The next toenail. Do you renounce your faith? No. The next toenail. Do you renounce your faith? And then if all the toenails are gone, he still won't renounce his faith, then they would cut off pieces of his feet. From the toes to the heels and whatever's left over on his feet. Guess what? This was a favorite torture device for little children. For little children back then. Little children were tortured for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My brother and sister in Christ, this is just a handful of what I can say of what the, your brethren went through in the tortures of the Catholic Inquisition. If I were to tell you more, then it would take too much time. Only demonic spirits can fill up the minds of such priests, of such a church who proclaims to do it under the name of Jesus. And guess what? They sprinkled the iron coffin maiden they sprinkled the torture devices for God's blessing on it. That's what they did back then. They did all that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Satanic. That is satanic as hell. And yet your brethren, they stood strong for the Lord Jesus. And they went through that torture. And they withstood it for the Lord Jesus Christ. The tortures, it can go on for hours and hours. Victims were thrown off of cliffs and onto the spikes to die slowly. Women's breasts were pierced by hooks and then torn apart. Babies were ripped out of pregnant mothers, then fed to the swine. Victims' eyes were gouged. Victims' feet were crushed by the Spanish, Spanish boots. The victim's head, they exploded because they filled up their mouth with gunpowder and lighted it, and their heads would explode. Victims' private parts, their private parts, were severed and placed on top of poles for public display. Victims' teeth, eyes, and bones were broken and crushed and plucked out because of the torture device of the head crusher, and it would pluck out all of their intestines inside their faces. The victims' bodies were burned and broken by the wheel. Victims were rolled back and forth with rollers filled with spikes. Victims were burned alive with boiling pitch as splendid displays of lantern lights for dinner time. Victims were tied with animal skins to be torn apart by dogs. Victims were locked up in bags of scorpions and then tossed into the rivers. Victims were chained close to the prison floors and walls so that the rats and the insects can crawl all over them and it would even fill up to the ear and the mouth. Victims ears and their mouths, they would put hot lead in it. Victims, they were also choked to death by their own body parts and their urine and their dung. And of course we must realize that all of us su suffer tremendous persecution when we are so busy and so uncomfortable from a little sun heat and criticism from people when soul winning. This is the Christianity that we live in today. The Christianity that is so sorry and that is so weak and a bunch of sissies. And we got to realize that my brethren, my brothers and sisters in Christ, including men, women, old men and children, they died, they bled to death for the Lord Jesus Christ. And all we could do is whine about some problem here and there when you didn't even get one scratch on your body. See? In a small town in Pomerania, a group of soldiers, they captured women and little girls up to 10 years of age. While ravishing the children, they forced the women to sing hymns or they would cut the children to pieces. Can you picture that? The way that they would treat those little girls and then those mothers, they have to sing a hymn while doing that. How can you sing a hymn with all your heart when doing that before your eyes? Then afterwards, then they would force the women to gratify their lusts 
or they would burn the children alive. There was once an old man who was stripped naked, and then he was tied on his back to the table. They tied a large and wild cat on top of his belly. And while they tied that cat across his belly, you know what they did? They pricked that cat. And when they pricked that cat, that cat, that wild cat went so crazy. Started meowing and started taking out its claws and ripping up, scratching up that old man's abdomen. That it finally tore open the abdomen. And then the intestines and the blood spilled out of his stomach. And the cat would even gnaw at the intestines while they kept mercilessly pricking that cat. And it was an old man, an old man, who had to die that way for the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was another person of William Lithgow. He was accused of being a spy and religious treason, so he suffered in solitary confinement. He was then tortured on the rack for five hours. He was tied closely to the walls, being infested with vermin from the eyes to the mouth. And while they were sweeping the prison floors, they would deliberately sweep the vermin on his imprisoned body. His feet were tied so closely to the iron shackles that they even were in fact stuck to the iron shackles. So when they broke off his shackles, it tore off a half inch of his heel. In the end, he suffered 60 different tortures during his sentence. And if that's not an enough, 11 more after his sentence. There was another Christian named John Frith who was tied to a stake to be burnt alive. However, the fire sticks were so few and the weather was windy, so it blew off the fire and then already his hair and skin was scorched from the flame. So he's begging for mercy to die, so then they had to light a second fire on top of that. And when they lighted that second fire, it burned his lower parts and upper parts. But the sticks were so few again, and the wind blew it out again. And that strong Christian was black in the mouth, his lips sunk to the gums, and his tongue, his tongue was completely swollen, that he was beating his chest so much in pain. And then he beat his chest so much in pain that in fact he hit it so hard that one, is, one of his arms fell off. And when one of his arms fell off, the other arm was gushing out fat, water, and blood at his fingertips. He finally died in the third fire. Let me tell you one Protestant preacher, just one. There's a whole paragraph of what kind of torture he went through. You want to hear this? Page 191 of Fox's Book of Martyrs. Listen to this. They placed him amidst them and made him the subject of their derision and mockery during a whole day's entertainment, trying to exhaust his patience, but in vain. They spit in his face, pulled his nose, and pinched him in most parts of his body. He was hunted like a wild beast until ready to expire with fatigue. They made him run the gauntlet between two ranks of them, each striking him with a twig. He was beat with their fists. He was beat with ropes. They scourged him with wires. He was beat with cudgels. They tied him up by the heels with his head downwards until the blood started out of his nose, mouth, etc. They hung him by the right arm until it was dislocated and then had it set again. <laughs> the same was repeated with his left arm. Burning papers dipped in oil were placed between his fingers and toes. His flesh was torn with red hot pincers. He was put to the rack. They pulled off the nails of his right hand. They re the same repeated with his left hand. He was bastinoed on his feet. A slit was made in the right ear. The same repeated on his left ear. His nose also was slit. They whipped him through the town upon an ass. They made several incisions in his flesh. They pulled off the toenails of his right foot. The same they repeated with his left foot. He was tied up by the loins and suspended for a considerable time. The teeth of his upper jaw were pulled out. The same was repeated with his lower jaw. Boiling lead was poured upon his fingers. The same was repeated with his toes. A knotted cord 
was twisted about his forehead in such a manner as to force out his eyes. During the whole of these horrid cruelties, particular care was taken that his wounds should not mortify and not to injure him mortally until the last day when the forcing out of his eyes proved his death. One man, one by a believing Christian, and you got one or two or three problems going on, and then uh, oh, you're suffering so much for the Lord Jesus Christ, yes? Yeah. Look at this. What your brethren went through. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. By believers got to realize this. We go through suffering. That's a reality. You got to open your eyes and realize we by believers go through suffering, and that's just life. That's just life. We go through suffering. That's why I keep reminding myself of these kind of Christians. So that I can stop feeling sorry for myself and sucking my thumb. And realize that I've got to be strong for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because why? There's too much to do for the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 20. My second point is vessels out of tribulation. Vessels out of tribulation. Look at verse 20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Notice that the Bible says there are many different vessels for the Lord. And if you look at 1 Peter 1, verse 7, you don't have to turn there, but 1 Peter 1, 7 shows you what those vessels are. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Those vessels, you know how they come out differently? Because they went through fire. They went through suffering. They went through the trial. Brethren, what a blessing to see so many different vessels that God can use. He can use anyone. From little children to old men. Male and female. He can use anyone for his glory. Let me tell you all these different vessels that the Lord mightily used. If, if you are a mother, then this illustration is for you. There was a person named Mrs. Prest. She was brought before the Catholic Council. She was first publicly ridiculed for her short stature and ugly thick appearance. But you know what? That woman, though she was considered ugly and short and she was made fun of by the Catholic Council, she refuted all of their Catholic doctrines. You know why? Because she knew the book and they only knew the traditions of men. So you know what these Catholic educated scholars said? Just like the world today? Just like the world today against Bible believers? Oh, you're uneducated. You don't know how to express words properly. And they made fun of her for that. Oh, you're poor. You're low down. You know what she replied? <laughs> True, though I am not learned, I am content to be a witness of Christ's death. And I pray you make no longer delay with me, for my heart is fixed. And I will never say otherwise, nor turn to your superstitious doing. Amen. She accused them for believing in superstition, those educated scholars, you. Evolution is superstitious, amen. Make fun of my... Make fun of whatever degrees I have or whatever degrees these people have or having no diploma whatsoever. You're so superstitious, you scholar you, for believing in evolution. <coughs> she was offered money. But you know what? She rejected it because, she said, I am going to a city where money bears no mastery. And while I am here, God has promised to feed me. She was assaulted and constantly burdened. Now, this is hard. Look at this. This mother was pressured by her husband and by her children to renounce her faith. Because the Catholic tried to force to persuade her to renounce the faith. So they used her family to pressure her. But you know what she said? <sighs> Listen to this now. When she was sentenced to death, she instead praised God. And she said, God forbid that I should lose the life eternal for this carnal and short life. 
I will never turn from my heavenly husband to my earthly husband. From the fellowship of angels to mortal children. And if my husband and children be faithful, then am I theirs. But until then, what? God is my father. God is my mother. God is my sister, my brother, my kinsman. God is my friend most faithful. She realized that's all the family that I need. And she died for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you mothers say that during your hour of suffering? How many of you mothers have suffered for the name of Jesus like that? Any of you are young? Any children out there? This story is for you. Didn't you know children? Yes, children are strong for the faith. Alberto Rivera recorded that there were 8 to 10 year olds who were street preaching. Oh, that would put some grown people to shame, amen? 8 to 10 year old street preaching during the Inquisition. And you know what? They were burnt alive by the Catholic Church. Because that was forbidden. Let me give you one story of this child. <clears throat> He's a little 8 year old. John Fetty was tortured for days. And then his little eight-year-old son, William, wanted to visit his father in prison. <clears throat> when the priest found out about it, he told that little eight-year-old, Why, thy father is a heretic. You know what that little eight-year-old said? <laughs> he, <laughs> he looked straight, boldly at the priest. And that little eight-year-old, who can say a lot of words better than grown adults, that little eight-year-old told that priest, My father is no heretic, for you have Balaam's mark. Amen. <laughs> that little eight-year-old accused that priest, You have the mark of a false prophet, Balaam. Amen. Woo, man, that priest, man, that priest went bo bonkers. He got so mad. So he tied up that little eight-year-old and used a whip and beat him and beat him. And that little eight-year-old cried out for mercy, but then that priest just beat him and beat him. So much in pain until that little eight-year-old finally collapsed into unconsciousness. And then they dragged that little body of that eight-year-old to his father in prison. And that father, he could cry out, oh, my boy, my boy. But they tore him away from his father's arms and William died at a separate prison from the heavy wounds. And little children, can little children stand strong for the Lord Jesus Christ and think that you're too, you think you're too young to serve God? You think that church, church is boring and living for Jesus Christ is boring? Look at this little eight-year-old, what he did for the name of Jesus Christ. You've been too comfortable in the world. Yeah. Are you a couple? Here's the story for couple, a husband and wife. This is quite a story. When Timothy was commanded to show where he hid the scriptures, you know what he replied? Listen to this. Had I children, I would sooner deliver them up to be sacrificed than part with the word of God. You know that governor? The governor in a rage ordered, torture him. And they tortured Timothy. And while Timothy was being tortured, his wife named Mara gently urged him, please recant, please recant, dear. You know what that you know what her husband did? Her husband looked at her and she he rebuked her and said, You don't really love me after all. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. No, I love you, that's why I want you to recant. No, you don't love me after all. If you really loved me, then you would let me die like this for Jesus Christ and not make me Amen. fall down into sin. Amen. You know what that wife did? Un she was so much under conviction. And what a true wife. She said, I'm going to die with him. So you know what? The governor pleaded, hey, it's not your fault. It's just your husband. And the wife said, no, I'm going to die with my husband for my faith in the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. And you know what? They were crucified side by side. And they died together being crucified on the cross. Amen. How many of you husband and wives can have such a strong bond where you would encourage each other to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and when you go through suffering you would urge each other to stay strong for the Lord Jesus Christ rather than whine and complain and then bail down and cut down a little bit on your spiritual duties if you're a young adult this is a good story for you William Gardner he was raised and educated under a merchant so he was gonna become a successful businessman you know, he went, he, got, he went through his schooling, so to speak. He got his job and everything. He's got his future planned out. 
But you know what? He was so grieved to see his fellow countrymen adhering to the Catholic Mass. <laughs> you know what that young person did? So that young person, William Gardner, William, he forsook his worldly life. He said, you know what? Let it be all sacrifice for the name of Jesus Christ. I care too much about my fellow countrymen to tell them that this is wrong, this is sin, the Catholic Mass. So he gave up his promising career, and then he attended the Mass where the king was going to be. So the king was there. <laughs> this is so oh, man, the king was there. The priest was there. <laughs> this is quite a riot. I wish I was there to see it. <laughs> And the priest took out, you know, the wafer and then, you know, did the sign of the cross, asked God's blessing on it. Do you know what William did? William got so mad looking at that that he went over there, took that wafer, threw it on the ground, and stomped yeah, it with yeah. his foot in front of all the yeah, Catholic yeah, priests. Yeah. Boy, the Catholic priest, he got so mad after that. And then so the, <laughs> the king, he said, uh, he was just young. He was being, he wasn't thinking. But then Gardner insisted, no, it was my own conscience. This is wickedness. This is wrong. No, I did it on my own conscience. I wasn't being foolish about it. So they tortured Gardner. And they, what, you know the pulley? They pulled him up on the pulleys like this, and they burnt him alive. But you know what? The Lord honored it that one of the fires sweeped across his dead body and burned down one of the ca king's Catholic ships. So that went Amen. down to the ground, too. <laughs> How many of you young people can get... You have your all future, your career planned out, but you let that hinder your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you willing to suffer and say, look, it doesn't matter about the job opportunities and the grades in my school or then the money that I'm developing or the family that I'm planning out. I got to realize that suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ, if I give all that up and I have to suffer, let it be for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, this was from the 1400s we got to understand. 1400s. What kind of a day and age we live in? If you hear a preacher talking like this, you know what people will think? Whoa, man. You're a fanatic. You're messed up. Boy, I think you got to calm down. This was 1,400 people. Amen. 1,400. Man, what happened to Christians today? Man, you heard these stories are extreme. You got to admit, they're kind of extreme, right? right? You know why? Because you watered down, you see? Yeah. You watered down. You weren't strong for the Lord Jesus Christ. My goodness, how much am I ashamed of myself to see these people back in the 1100s and the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s who bled and died like this for the Lord Jesus Christ. Little children too. Man, if we had one of them alive today and they lived among us, if they came to San Jose Bio Baptist Church, I think that one of them would go, man, what happened here? Yeah. What happened here? And then they went through the other churches, they'll go, man, what happened here? My. What happened to Christians today? If you're an old and elderly person, then this story is for you. There was a man named Sir Gaspar Kaplitz. He was 80 years old. 80 years old. And that old man, when he was about to die, you know what that old man did? <laughs> he was actually excited. He was excited. Finally, I get to suffer and die for Jesus Christ. You know, in fact, he complained. He complained, Lord, why didn't you let me die sooner for you? <laughs> why didn't you let me suffer sooner for you? Woo, man, that's what that elderly man said. There was an officer who was concerned about his old age. And he said, look, you're too old, man. Why don't you ask pardon and forgiveness? Just ask pardon and forgiveness. You know, you don't have to be a Christian like this. Just ask pardon and forgiveness from that Catholic king. But you know what that, you know what that old man said? Ask pardon? Who's he going to ask pardon to? Not no priest. I will ask pardon of God, whom I have frequently offended, but not of the emperor. No, no, as I die innocent and with a clear conscience, I would not be separated from this noble company of martyrs. And he died and joined his fellow brethren for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many elderly people can be that strong for the Lord Jesus Christ? And they make up excuses for their health and circumstances in life. No one is too old to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And this man, he died for his faith with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then elderly people, they complain about the health problems and some of the circumstances they go through in their life. When this old man said, why can I have suffered sooner for Jesus Christ? For those working in the ministry, here's an illustration that will convict you. For those working in the ministry, there was a man named John Philpot who was a minister. Now he was forced to sign a recantation. And sadly, he did sign the recantation. But man, he couldn't do it with a clean conscience. So after he signed the recantation, all the Catholics, they were overjoyed. They're saying, okay, finally, you're a Ken. And he said, can I have that paper back? So they gave him the paper back, and then he tore up the paper after that. He's like, no, I'm not going to recant. I take it back. <laughs> they got mad. They imprisoned him, and they put him through 14 different trials. But then Phil Pot, he kept stumping his Catholic persecutors. You know what one of the Catholic priests said? <laughs> Instead of the spirit of the gospel, which you boast to possess, I think it is the spirit of liquor, which your fellow martyrs have had, who were drunk before their death and went, I believe, drunken to it. <laughs> you know what Philpot re re retorted back? He retorted back, you know, it appeared by your communication that you are better acquainted with that spirit of liquor than the spirit of God. Yeah, yeah. Where... Amen. Wherefore I tell thee, thou, thou painted wall and hypocrite, that God shall rain fire and brimstone upon such blasphemers as thou art. Amen. My Amen. goodness. You talk about you're going to get locked up for that, for saying stuff like that. I don't, and you think I'm hard when I preach? <laughs> you think I'm hard when I preach? Brethren, 1400s, man. 1500s, man. 1300s, 1100s. When he was, a, this is one of my favorite stories. So when Philpot, when he was approaching the stake, there were two soldiers who offered to carry him to the stake. You know what Philpot said? Would you make me a pope? I'm content to make my journey on foot. Amen. He's like, I'm not the Catholic pope. I can do it myself, thank you. Amen. 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 Arriving at the stake, he said, shall I disdain to suffer at the stake when my Redeemer did not refuse to suffer the most vile death upon the cross for me? And when he was burned alive, he was quoting scripture while he was being burnt alive. Amen. Look at 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4. You know now why I preach this. You know why? Because it does get me under conviction too, you see. It gets, this gets me under conviction. Many times we look at our own petty problems and we think that we're too small, we're all alone, and that we're going through 24-7 hell on earth and all that. But then when you look at this life story, my brethren, you would realize that we've got it made. We're too blessed by God. And we've gotten too comfortable. And we've got to be strong. And look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. My last point is victory out of tribulation. Victory out of tribulation. This is a way to die, man. This is a way to end your life. This is why this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. One of my life verses. For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul, when he ended his life, he ended his life suffering and dying for the name of Jesus. Man, you talk about real. We got some real people. We got victory. That's right. Victory out of suffering and death. Man, look at this. This is such victory, man. What a way to go, man. What a way to die. Martyrs, they love to suffer for Christ so much that when they approach the stakes to be burnt alive, they would even hug and they would even kiss the stakes. Didn't you know that? Martyrs would do that. Some of the martyrs, they would complain about wasting so much time to prolong their death that they would say, hurry up and kill me. I want to go home to heaven. Amen. Some of the wives 
they would see their husbands burnt alive and they would shout out loud, hey, if he burns, then so must I. Some of the martyrs, they would gather together and they would huddle together. And when the lions came out of their dens and when the lions surrounded them, the martyrs would huddle together and they would lift up their hands and they would sing praise praises to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? To God be the glory, great things he hath done. To God be the glory? Wow. Man, what a way to go. Some of the martyrs, when they were ready to die, they would even provoke their fellow Christians, hey, you should die for Jesus too. And, they, and what they did was, there were several martyrs that, because they have nothing to write, they would take out some kind of paper and they would use their blood as their ink. They got plenty of blood to shed, you see. They got plenty of ink. They would take it out and they would write letters telling them about suffering for Jesus Christ and dying for his name. And then they would, and then they would end it with, signed in my own blood, so and so. Man, what a way to go. What a way to, what victory, victory. Yeah. Can a Buddhist, can a Catholic, can an atheist do that with, at their end? No. No way. Some of the martyrs, they would rejoice and be so happy when they were crucified and when they were crowned with thorns and when spears were thrust in their sides because they said, I want to imitate the death of my Lord Jesus Christ. Whew. Some of the martyrs, they would die so happily. That's why, see, those atheists... <laughs> Those Buddhists, those Catholics, those lost people, they would get baffled, right? Yeah. So those Catholics, they were so baffled. They were like, what? How, how can you die like that? They were so baffled. So the Catholic priests, they had a hard time doing that. If there's something you can't overrun and overpower, it's the death, the victorious death of a Bible-believing Christian. Right, yeah. You cannot have any answer to that. Right. So the Catholic priests, they had to cover that up. So one of their excuses was this. Well, Satan took their souls before they actually died in the fire, making their senses of feeling past them. So they're trying to cover up saying, well, they didn't really feel it. Ridiculous, you see, what they have to resort to. Because it is such a victory for Christians that there is nothing you can do to conquer it. Talk about victory. Two citizens of Brescia, Faustines and Jovita, they suffered great torments for their faith. And when they were tortured for their faith, out of that bloodthirsty Roman populace in the Colosseum, crying out and hollering for their deaths, there was a pagan named Calosiorus, who was struck so much by Faustine's and Jovita's death that the Holy Spirit convicted him, and then he finally bursted out, Great is the God of the Christians! Great is the God of the Christians! So they had to kill him too after that. The proconsul, they demanded Polycarp. Swear and I will release thee. Reproach Christ. Polycarp he, Polycarp, he answered, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? So they burnt him alive at the stake. But you know what? The fire couldn't kill him, and that made their enemies mad. So then in anger, one of them thrust a spear and thrust Polycarp with a spear. But you know what? The blood came out and doused the fire and he still wouldn't die. So then the enemies got so mad so they had to light a second fire to finally finish the job. He died victoriously for the Lord Jesus Christ. When John Kutnar, he came to the place of execution. Oh, I love this. There was a Jesuit, all learned of the wisdom of the world. He told Kutnar, embrace the Catholic face, faith which alone can save and arm you against the terrors of death. Kutnar, he replied, Your superstitious faith I abhor. It leads to perdition. And I wish for no other arms against the terrors of death than a good conscience. And then the Jesuit, he sarcastically said to the public, Oh, the, these Protestants are impenetrable rocks. Kutnar, he replied back, you are mistaken. It is Christ that is the rock, and we are firmly fixed upon it. <laughs> See, truly, Jesus said, hey, don't think about all the answers. I'll give you a mouth to speak against your persecutors. Wow. 
man, it would fail me to tell you story after story. Right before he died, Christopher Chobert, he said, quote, I come in the name of God to die for his glory. I have fought the good fight and finished my course. And then when he put his head on the block, he looked at the executioner and he said, so executioner, do your office. And he offered his head. Roland Taylor, when he approached the burning stake, when he was getting closer and closer to the stake, Roland Taylor said, thank be God, I am even at home. Yeah, <laughs> Reverend Saunders, before he died, he prayed flat face on the ground, and then he embraced the stake. And when he embraced the burning stake, he said, welcome thou cross of Christ, welcome everlasting life. Right before he died, Lawrence, he cried out to his fellow martyrs when they were being surrounded by the lions. He told all of his martyrs, these are the precious treasure of the church. These are the treasure indeed in whom the faith of Christ reigneth, in whom Jesus Christ hath his mansion place. What more precious jewels can Christ have than those in whom he hath promised to dwell? When Mr. Latimer was being burned alive, you know what he told his fellow brother in Christ while the fire was burning them up? <laughs> we shall this day, by God's grace, light up such a candle in England as I trust will never be put out. <laughs> Woo, man, man, I could just, man, it could just burst my heart. These are brethren who died. Here's a, here's a woman who died for the Lord Jesus Christ named Joyce Luz. She said... When I know that I shall behold the amiable countenance of Christ, my dear Savior, the ugly face of death does not much trouble me. Amen. <laughs> right before he died, Simeon Susicki, he was so impatient to die that you know what he said? He was so impatient to die that he said, come on, every moment delays me from entering into the kingdom of Christ. Woo, man, what, what, man. To be back at the 1500s, maybe we would live a lot better for Jesus Christ. Amen. What, here's my favorite story that I like to close. Ignatius, Ignatius. When he died, he was torn apart by lions in the Colosseum. But you know what he did? When the lions approached Ignatius, Ignatius actually opened up his arms to embrace the lion. He went like this. He was like, come on, come on, bite me. You know what? He, he invited the lions. Hey, I'm good food to eat. He said this, quote, Now I begin to be a disciple. I care for nothing, a visible or invisible things, so that I may win Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let breaking of bones and tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. Be it so, only may I win Christ Jesus. And when the lions approached him, Ignatius egged them on. And you know what he said? He cried out to the lion, I am the wheat of Christ. I am going to be ground with the teeth of wild beasts that I may be found pure bread. He said this, I'm food, eat me up. Because you know what? I'm the food for Jesus Christ. I'm the bread of Jesus Christ. And he died. You see, no matter what persecution that all of hell can throw at you, no matter what persecution they may throw at you, I don't know what you're going through, friend. You're probably going through a financial problem, family problem, money's running out. Your health is taking a toll on you more and more. Friends and loved ones are criticizing you, looking down on you. I don't know what you're going through. But you know what? No matter what kind of suffering you go through, there's always victory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you know what you can do? You have no burning stake to proudly show to the Savior. You have not a bloody mark or bruise that you can proudly show to the Savior. But what you can do is you can proudly show to the Savior through your suffering right now and said, I went through this for you, Lord Jesus Christ.
Hello, this is Pastor Gene Kim of San Jose Bio Baptist Church. Have you ever asked this question that if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you can go to heaven? My friend, it's so simple to get saved. You first got to realize that you can't go to heaven because you've sinned against God. And God, as a holy judge, he has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you feel sorry over your sinful condition. And if you do, there is hope for you. You see, Jesus, who is God, left heaven, came down here on earth, died on the cross, raised himself from the dead. Why did he do all that? So his blood can wash away the sins for you. So you see, that's your only way to heaven, of what he did on the cross, and not what you do in cleaning up all your sins, and going to church, getting baptized, or doing any sort of good work. It's faith alone in what Jesus did on the cross. If you can do that, then all you have to do is say that to God. You might say, well, I don't know how to say it. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I am sorry for being a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sins. I trust in that alone and not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend. If someone were to ask you, how did you get saved? It's very simple, right? What did you do? I just put my faith on what Jesus did on the cross. That's it. My friend, congratulations on your salvation. Right now, because Satan can't damn you to hell, what he's going to try to do now is try to ruin your life. And he did a very good job in this world. That's why it's so hard to find truth, and there are so many lies with a gazillion different churches, different Bibles, different beliefs, different religions. So my friend, it is so important to grow in truth and get involved in a Bible-believing work that can save you from a lot of trouble. There are four things we recommend for you to do, which is found in the resources link below. Number one, get involved in a Bible-believing church near you. Number two, Study the King James Bible issue and have only that kind of Bible, no other modern version Bible. Number three, study dispensationalism so you can find the right doctrine and truth. Number four, study only under Bible-believing teachers. My friend, this is all explained further in the resources link below, so please click on it and get to work in a Bible-believing work because you only have one life to live for Him and you don't want to waste it away by the devil. And I'll be inside that great palace and the smoke will be so thick. I'll drop to my knees and I'll drop to my face like those Navy SEALs do. And I'll start crawling. I'll start crawling. And I'll look down that uh, ivory aisle there and I'll see a, a throne. And I'll see some feet. And got holes in them and they got jewel sandals on. Then I'll pull myself up to those feet. And I'll cry on those feet like that woman that cried on his feet and wiped the tears with her hair. Hey, glory to God, you're going to let him do the shining. You're going to say, oh, God, thank you. Hallelujah. And the angels will worship. And the cherubim will worship. And the seraphim will worship. And thank God an independent Baptist will worship. Another song said, once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. They searched through heaven and found a Savior Amen. to save a glorious soul like me. Woo! Glory to God. He stood out there in beside him and he's go, ho, 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 Jesus saves. <laughs> the Bible saves from God's soul. And he's preaching and the people that's ringing the bell, they be like, oh. And he'd stand up, and, uh, and people walk up and they said, Wow, Santa Claus preaching. What? Then you enter the throne of glory. Yeah. Oh, the Father opens up his arms, come on, there's a banner raised up in the sky, yeah. all the angels. You go to He did not do anything for you. He's not through Buddha. 
is not through the commandments. It's only through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm good. I'm just going to stay still and I'm just going to study at home. Uh, uh, I, watch, I, I watch preaching on the TV. Uh, yeah, you can turn the preacher off. You yeah. can turn me off. like your skin turning to gold or something, you don't know what's going on. It's about two more steps, here's that crowd. Hi, how you doing? Hey, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hey, see, hey, see like that? Way down there at the edge of that street, there's the Lord of said glory. And down he comes off that throne. He always would come down for a sinner. <laughs> and he comes down there, well done, now, good and faithful servant of the joy of our Lord. Now, old boy's heart going down there, it says, Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Then he laid down on that table, and Dr. Grace got out the scalpel, and he removed that old cold stony heart out of my friend. Oh, he threw it in the trash can, and he put a brand new heart into my friend's chest. And when he when he woke up, uh, he looked around and he said, "Oh my." Everything has been changed. Everything looks different. Oh, I'm so happy now that I had a the heart operation. Hey, praise God, there's no other savior like our heart. Oh, man.